Hey, this is Joe, Gray Bench Electronics. Welcome back to the bench. So recently, JHS put out a video showing them building what they are calling a Japan fuzz. They basically took a crew, flew to Japan, bought a bunch of parts in a, uh, a electronics mart in Tokyo, put it together and, and uh, made a song, I think. Uh, I'll put a link to that video in the description if you haven't seen it already. Actually, there'll be a card thing in the corner there. And if you want to bring up the schematic here, which is the schematic for that circuit that um, Josh Scott put together, there will be a link for the schematic in their video description. So go check that out. I wanted to talk a bit about the fuzz they put together and we'll put it together on the breadboard, have a listen to it. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in, in building this fuzz, um, hopefully this video will help out. For the people interested in building, uh, I do have good news, uh, which is that you don't have to fly to Tokyo to build this. You also don't need uh, vintage correct parts or vintage parts at all. Um, this, this circuit will work just fine with modern components. You also don't necessarily need germanium transistors. This will work fine with silicon transistors. The circuit as it sits is set up for positive ground. So that means that ground here is positive with respect to the power rail, which is negative nine volts here. So your battery connection will be black to the power rail and red to ground. I'll put a link in the description to a DIY stomp boxes thread where a uh, user named Tone Ranger is putting together a stripboard layout for building this fuzz with a voltage inverter. I don't think it's verified yet, but I, that, they're still working on it. So um, go follow that if you're interested in building this with negative ground. As it sits, it is a positive ground pedal and that's a consequence of the PMP transistors. So if you're gonna do silicon, you would just use PMP silicon transistors. So let's just go through the schematic here and talk about it. First off, there's no question, this is definitely a fuzz face, at least fuzz face derivative, however you wanna say it, whatever. The overall topology is straight from a fuzz face. We have the DC coupled Q2 from Q1, the collector resistors. In this case, we have a trim pot for a collector of Q2, which is a very common mod. Down here for the fuzz control, it's usually a reverse log 1K pot. In this case, we just replaced that with a single 1K resistor. The feedback, uh, resistor is the same here, 100K, 2.2 input cap is right out of a fuzz face. The first uh, transistor collector resistor is a 30K, it's usually a 33K. The top of this resistor divider, this is usually a 470 ohm, now it's a 1K. The note here says impacts tone and volume, that's true. The cap down here, this is usually a 22 microfarad cap, now it's a 47 microfarad, so that's going to add base with the inclusion or the increased cap. Probably the, the biggest departure from a standard fuzz face is the omission of an output cap, followed up by the inclusion of a bypass cap around the volume pot. The volume pot here also is a 500K, which is another really common mod to get more volume out of the pedal. So first off, the bypass cap, what that's going to do is it's going to bypass certain frequencies around the volume, high frequencies. It's creating an alternate path for current around the volume knob, and uh, the value of the cap here is going to affect that. So that's going to be, it's going to allow more um, high frequencies, the larger this cap is. This is a 50 nanofarad cap, which is a pretty good size. This is a big part of why in that video, when you roll the volume off on this pedal, it gets brighter. It also has to do with the impedance of the circuit going from the guitar pickups, but uh, this is definitely part of it. When you have the volume maxed out here, you're essentially shorting across this cap, and so it's not in play. It's effectively like the wiper is connected here, so this cap doesn't do anything, and that's the same for other bright caps that are hooked up like this, like on a tube amp. When your volume is maxed out, the bright cap is essentially bypassed. But as you roll this volume back, now the wiper is connecting somewhere here in this resisted path on the potentiometer. And so the, the current coming from the circuit here has either a resistive path through the potentiometer to out or a path through the capacitor here to out. This here, the omission of the output cap is, is an interesting choice. Um, the note here says, a proper fuzz face will have a cap here, usually 10 nanofarads, which is true. I've omitted for chaos. Um, I think it's calling the result of doing this chaos is definitely one way to put it. The, uh, what's gonna happen here, so first, the output cap, what's its job? The job of the output cap primarily is to block DC voltage coming from this point in the circuit. We have a battery hooked up across the circuit here. It's going through the 1K, through the trim pot, through the potentiometer, and then out here through the 1K. That's the return path through the battery or for the battery through the circuit. So at this point here, we're going to have some DC voltage. It's going to be negative with respect to ground. So it's going to be at this point negative. If you, if you set the trim pot so you have negative four and a half volts at the collector here, this point's probably going to be negative six something volts, something like that. We're gonna build on a breadboard, we'll see. Uh, but there's going to be negative voltage at this point and because we don't have an output cap, there's going to be negative voltage at this point, which means there's going to be negative voltage through the, or the volume pot and then out 
through the alpha jack. This is generally considered a bad thing. Um, it's not dangerous necessarily. There definitely have been like mass produced products that have voltage on the output like this. And it's part of a reason why circuits often have an input cap so that if you do have DC voltage coming in your input, your input cap will take care of it. What it means in this case for a pedal is that this pedal is going to work differently depending on what you plug in next. Uh, so for example, I think it's perfectly understandable if someone would take this fuzz pedal and plug it straight into the front of an old tube amp. This is a drawing of an input stage for a pretty typical tube amp. You'll note the omission or the lack of a input cap. This is what a lot of your vintage tube amps and also your modern tube amps that are built based on vintage tube amps, this is what the, the beginning of that amp looks like. So this will be just your output jack here. Sometimes you'll have a resistor here to ground, like a one meg resistor, something like that. But if you plug this pedal into this tube amp, so you're essentially just connecting this boom straight to here like that, you're now sending DC voltage from this point here through the pot, through the jacks, through the cable, all the way here into this stage, sending that however many couple negative volts into the grid of your um, input tube for your tube amp. If you understand how a tube works, a tube is essentially a channel for electrons. And you have your cathode down here, and you have your plate up here. Let me use a better sharpie. Let's draw that. So this is your tube. You have your cathode here, your plate is sitting up here, and then you have a bunch of electrons flying through from the cathode to the plate. Inside here is a grid. It's a, it's a mesh that sits in there, and its job is to control the flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate. The way we do this is by effectively charging the grid with a negative voltage so that the electrons are partially repelled off the grid. Some make it through, that's what lets current flow through the tube, but some electrons are repelled off the grid which is, is like controlling the, the flow of current. That's the point of the grid. Here in the circuit, if we ignore the negative voltage coming from this pedal, the grid here is going to be negative with respect to the cathode because we have this 1.5K resistor here. So the grid here is referenced to ground through this one meg resistor. The cathode here is going to be lifted above ground by a couple volts here, maybe two volts, something like that at the cathode. And so the grid now is negative. If this is at zero volts, the grid now is negative with respect to the cathode. And so those electrons are going to be repelled and the grid is going to be able to flow current. But the specific amount of difference between the cathode and the grid in voltage is what allows the tube to amplify. Changing this resistor here is affecting the bias of the tube. It affects that idle point so that you can get upswing and downswing from your guitar signal coming in. If all of a sudden this zero volts becomes like negative five volts, we're changing the bias points of this tube. In this case, what it means is that the tube is going to go into at least partial cutoff. It's going to distort because your, the tube can no longer amplify the downgoing swing of the guitar signal. It, it can probably partially amplify the upgoing swing uh, because the upgoing is going to push this more positive, which is going to allow uh, the grid to be more or less negative with respect to cathode and more electrons will get through for amplification. But as the guitar swings down, this is going to go more negative here, which is going to send the tube further into cutoff. So you're going to get an un, like an uneven output from this tube, which maybe is fine or maybe not. It depends. The point I'm trying to make here is that this pedal is going to be very sensitive to whatever you plug in next or to say it the opposite way, whatever comes after this is going to be affected by the pedal here, which is usually not a good thing to do design-wise. I'm not saying it's bad because that's like a subjective thing. It's, it's something worth trying, I think, and that's why we're gonna do it. Uh, but it's something you should know going into it is that depending on what you plug in next, this pedal could go from sounding really crazy and cool or just not work at all. There's also the flip side to consider here, which is if you build this with NPN transistors and have um, negative ground. That means instead of negative voltage here at this point coming through to your output jack, now you're gonna have positive voltage. So now where this used to be with no, with a, a whatever, whatever's plugged into this didn't have DC voltage on it, now it has a couple volts positive. Now this grid, which used to be zero volts with respect to the cathode, now it's going to be up. It's going to be three volts positive, whatever, which means you're gonna turn this tube on really hard. You're essentially the, you will not be able to flow any more current through the tube. You'll just be wide open. 
and then it'll swing down and be able to amplify the down going because that's just going more negative with respect to cathode. As far as I know, it's really hard to impossible to just burn out like a 12AX7 by just going full throttle. I don't think you can do that. Don't, don't take my word for it on it. You know, do your research and maybe experimentation. I'm pretty sure it's pretty hard to like melt down a 12AX7 by just going full current. So I don't think it's, it's dangerous or anything, but it's, it's just a different consequence if you end up with a, going with MPN and have positive voltage here. Instead of turning the tube off hard by making the grid even more negative, now we're, we're turning the grid off. We're allowing more and more current to flow through the tube. And of course, if you have some circuit that comes after this that has a capacitor input, you should be fine because that capacitor should block the DC current as long as it's not um, shorted. I wanna be careful. I don't, I'm not shitting on this or anything. It's, I love experimentation. This is totally cool. It's almost definitely not gonna hurt anything or damage anything. It's fun to experiment with. And sometimes this is how you figure stuff out is you, you pull out capacitors or put in a, a jumper across and you say, hey, what does that do? Oh, that sounds weird. I kind of like that, or I kind of hate that. And then you don't do that, or you do it more and more. There's nothing wrong here. I'm not making any moral judgments. I'm just saying this is, this is the consequence of what happens when you pull the output cap in, is you get DC voltage and it's going to affect the next thing in the line, especially if there is no capacitor in here that's going to block that DC voltage on the input side. All right, so let's put this sucker together. I've got my breadboard here. I think I've shown this before on the pedal. This is the pedal PCB uh, breadboard thingy. It just makes breadboarding a little bit easier. It's also got a bunch of dust on it. Shows how often I breadboard. Uh, so we're gonna build the circuit out here, pretty much as a fuzz face. So we're just gonna go modern standard components and uh, I'll go ahead and put it together and then we'll jump back and do some voltage testing. Actually, before we put that together, while we find some transistors, this is my lot of used PMP germaniums. Again, you don't have to do germanium, you can do silicon for this. Uh, but I have germanium, so why not? Uh, so the schematic, according to this here, it's calling for uh, Toshiba 2SA 49s. I've said it for, before for other videos, the part number for germanium transistors really doesn't matter. What matters is the gain and leakage measurements. In this case, Josh Scott recommends a gain of around 100 HFE, at least that's what they used. And the proper trim is set to four and a half, but mess around with it, okay. So 100 HFE, as I've mentioned in my video about testing germanium transistors, which is linked right there, the gain of around 100 HFE without knowing the current that was put through the transistor, 100 HFE doesn't mean a lot. I'm going to assume that they had either one of these testers or like one of the bare bones, uh, Steve Daniels tester or RG Keen tester. The, the latter two test at about one milliamp or yeah, I think about one milliamp and the peak here tested five. So for me, if I won 100 HFE at those other testers, I would look maybe like 120, 130, something like that. If they did test the peak, then about 100. I'm just gonna go with 100 here because um, that's what I feel like doing, I guess. So as Josh Scott mentioned in their video, you wanna be careful not to touch germaniums while you're testing them because you can throw off the gain measurement. I uh, just wanna see, maybe I do have some Japanese ones in here. This is a uh, Matsushita 2SB173. There we go, Matsushita 2SB173. Matsushita was one of the big Japanese manufacturers of semiconductors. They uh, became Panasonic, the same Panasonic we know today. We'll throw this in the tester, see what happens. Fuzz face circuits don't require any specific amount of leakage, unlike other old fuzz pedals. So as low leakage as we can get is fine. HFE 89 and leakage of 43 microamps, which is perfect. Anything under 100 microamps for germanium is fine. 89, yeah, 90, I mean, that's close enough. Just for fun, I'll try to find uh, Japanese transistors, and this is one of them, so we'll stick with that. Let's see what else. All right, I don't see any more Japanese transistors in here, unfortunately, so we'll just go with this RCA. At least we'll test this. This is a 2N217. RCA 2N217. Throw this in the tester. I've tested with different devices in this bin, so the, sometimes the gains are off by like a bin or two. Um, yeah, this is 120. Let's see if we can find, I'll move this over to the right bin. Let's see if we can find one a little bit lower. It's probably more important if you want to stick to what JHS put together to find gains that are similar rather than specifically being 100 HFE. Let's try this one. Same thing, RCA2 and 217. 108, that's a little better. 
and leakage of 92 milliamps, or excuse me, 92 microamps. 92 milliamps would be way too much leakage. 109, 93. So we'll try these. Gains are a little bit far off, but I think it's okay. And we have one Japanese transistor, the Matsushita. So we got our two transistors. The Japanese 2SB173 is gonna be our Q1, and the RCA2N217 is our Q2. All right, so I got the Japan Fuzz now built here on the breadboard. So just to go over the circuit quickly, the input is coming here through the orange wire. Here are my power connections. I've moved the red wire here to the negative nine volt supply. It's one of the nice things about this breadboard is it's got a, a voltage inverter so I can just switch directly over to negative nine volts. And then I can use the power rails on the breadboard like my intuition would tell me to. So input's coming here through the orange wire here to the 2.2K or 2.2 microfarad input cap over here through to the base of Q1. Q1 has the 30K collector resistor up to the negative nine volt power rail. Emitter is connected to ground. The uh, 100K feedback resistor is right there coming over to the emitter Q2 to the base. 1K emitter resistor here for Q2, which is taking the place of the fuzz pot. 47 microfarad bypass cap. Over here, here is the trim pot connecting through the 1K to the trim pot and then to the collector. We'll test that for collector voltage in a second. The wiper, excuse me, the top connection for the volume pot is here, the red wire that has the connection to the 1K where the 1K and the trim pot meets, just like the schematic shows. So that's to this point here to the volume pot. And then the 50 nanofarad cap is across the red and yellow wires here, which are the wiper and top of the pot respectively. So that's the 50 nanofarad cap there. Bottom of the pot here is connected to the ground. And then just a, a quirk of this breadboard, there must be an output cap pr protection or something for the output jack, because I wasn't seeing the DC voltage I was expecting at the output. Uh, but when I just use a regular output jack, that works here. And we'll see that in a second. So that is the circuit. Let's go ahead and turn on the breadboard and you'll be able to see some voltages. So starting with the collector voltage of Q2, I right, read negative 6.4 volts. So we'll bring that to negative 4.5 approximately, close enough right there. And we can just look at the collector of Q1. There's no adjustment for it here, but it should be about 0 0.7, 0 0.64, that's fine. And the base of Q1 should be yeah, about 125, about 1.5, so that's fine there. And then at the output jack, because we have no output cap, we should see voltage, and we do. We have negative 3.6 volts or so at the output jack. If we had a, um, an output cap, the cap would block that voltage. All right, so let's go ahead and hook up for a listening test, and we'll see what it sounds like. All right, so I got the Japan Fuzz now hooked up for a listening test. The guitar is a Telecaster with a humbucker in the bridge, but it's split, so I'm going to be switching between like humbucker and single coil. Uh, I also have a single coil in the neck that I might turn on at some point. The amp is like a modded basement style thing with that same style input setup like we talked about earlier. It has just like this. So we'll see what that does. The collector's at four and a half volts. We're going straight into the amp. The microphone is an SM57 pointed directly at the cone. My guitar volume is maxed out right now, so we'll just turn it on and see what happens. Right now the volume pot's at zero. Okay, so immediately like full fuzz, just turning up the volume a little bit. All right, volume's rolled back to like seven, eight, seven or eight now. down a little farther on the volume. Okay, so you can see here, there's sort of like 
three settings on the volume. There's completely off. Uh, there is turned on just slightly. And then for most of the volume sweep, it doesn't do anything. At a certain point, the volume drops out when the, the upper side of the volume pot, there's not enough resistance there, and then it fades back in. And then this is full volume on the uh, volume pot. And this, I'll go full master volume, full amp volume. It's a little unruly. I'm gonna pull the guitar volume back, keep the volume on the pedal at max. So you can hear that at full volume, there's actually less overall distortion than if I roll the volume back on the pedal a little bit. I'll demonstrate that here. My guitar volume's on approximately five or so. So this is full volume. And if I pull the pedal volume back a bit, And then off. There's pretty atypical function of the volume control here. It, it's completely off at zero, which that's not atypical, but when you turn it up, it goes full fuzz immediately. It stays pretty consistent for 70, 80% of the sweep until you hit that fade out moment. And then it like clicks into that last setup with max volume. I wanted to see what would happen if you pull out the little bypass cap around the volume control, so let's try that. So I got my volume on seven, and I'm gonna turn this volume up all the way. Actually, so we'd expect for the volume being up all the way, pulling out the cap should do nothing, so let's test that first. Yeah, so that checks out at full volume on this, this uh, bright cap, I guess you could call it, or bypass cap around the volume control is not doing anything. Put that back, but at like half volume here, roughly. Yeah, so you can hear there, when you pull out that cap, it gets less bright, which is exactly what we expected to do. It must have been that Josh Scott, when he was designing it, he didn't like how dark it was without that cap, I would assume, and put that in to get some high end back into the um, output. All right, so just for the sake of testing, I've now switched this over to a standard fuzz face output. So we've got a 10 nanofarad cap coming out of the junction between the 1K and the trim pot, and that's going to the wiper, or excuse me, to the top of the pot, and then wiper to the output jack. One thing that didn't occur to me, but did as I was setting this up, is 
when you don't have an output cap, not only are you going to be sending DC out, but the bias conditions of the Q2 here are going to be dependent on the volume control. So this volume is not only just affecting like the output signal, either feeding off the ground or passing through the circuit, it's also affecting the bias of Q2. So that's why it's, it's functioning so weird without an output cap. But now that we have an output cap, this should go much more just like a standard fuzz face. A standard fuzz face with a fixed fuzz control all the way at max, I should say. Roll my vo guitar volume back to like seven or so. Guitar volume back a little more. Last thing I'll mention is there's a lot of noise and whatnot coming through. Part of that is definitely just the fuzz face being a very high gain circuit, but also it's, it's due to a breadboard not having any shielding. That's gonna introduce noise that would have been eliminated had it uh, been encased in a conductive enclosure. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the video going through building the Japan fuzz here, trying it with my equipment, my amp. As I hope I've demonstrated, uh, this fuzz, its performance, the way it sounds, is going to depend a lot on your amplifier and your guitar. It's going to uh, interact in a bunch of unique, sometimes maybe unwanted, sometimes clever and desirable ways. The only way to really find out is to build it. That's the beauty of breadboarding, of DIY pedals, is if this is simple stuff, we can build it at home. You don't need to use the vintage components that JHS used in their video. Uh, you can build it with standard stuff and it'll sound pretty much the same. Not that there's anything wrong with going with the Mojo parts, that's fine too whatever floats your boat. As far as building, what I would say is if you're a regular DIY pedal builder, you love doing it, absolutely have fun experimenting, go for it. If you don't build pedals a lot and you're watching this video, first off, thank you, I appreciate that. I'm glad to see you're interested in building pedals. What I would say for this is I would recommend giving yourself a way out if you find that this is just kind of too unruly. So there's options you could do if you're actually gonna build this out. Choosing to include the, the bright cap could be as simple as a switch. Um, if you have like a just like a simple uh, single pole, single throw switch, you would hook up the output cap, or the little bright cap here actually, to one side of the switch like that. You could just connect the two sides of the potentiometer, one side to one of these lugs and one side to the other. And when you hit the switch over here, it completes the circuit with the, with the capacitor across those two sides of the pot. And then when you push it over here, it's just disconnected. So that, that's one way you could bring this out. For the output cap, same thing. You have the connection from the middle going here to the top of the volume pot. And then on one side, it just connects straight with a wire to here. On the other side, it goes through a capacitor to here. Same thing, you can do that with a switch. You can even do a double pole, double switch and do them both at the same time. Switch out the bright cap and add an output cap. And then on the other side, bring in the bright cap and remove the output cap. You can do that with just one double pole, double throw switch. The 30K, Resistor here, you could put sockets in there, so you could try the normal 33K. That's probably not gonna make that big of a difference, so I wouldn't sweat it. Same with the 1K versus the 470. Again, not a big difference. It's still gonna sound like a fuzz face. 47 microfarad cap, you could socket that, put in a 22. This here is gonna be your biggest difference, those the output cap and the bright cap. So yeah, that's what I would say. If you don't build pedals a lot and you want something uh, that's gonna have 
a lot of utility and range. Build it like a fuzz face, but give yourself the option of trying the Japan fuzz maybe on a switch. And also uh, take this 1K and actually just make it a potentiometer like a normal fuzz face. You can always create this by turning your fuzz up all the way. Yeah, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you found it informational or entertaining. If you did, I'd appreciate you hit the like button and subscribing. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'm Joe from Great Bench Electronics. Thank you for watching.